um, it's, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thank the organizers, um, and I especially thank one of the organizers, Dana, because he was in my calculus class, I don't know when, but way too long ago. Okay, and um, so, uh, so I felt like in this short amount of time, it's too much to really talk about the whole course, and then coming after several people, they've set the stage beautifully for me, so we've already had a discussion, at least in this session, about um, more global kind of questions. We've had some discussion about the videos and whatever. So I thought I would focus on this. And then um, <clears throat> in preparing the written version, so one of my themes is that speaking about math is different than writing math. Um, I wrote up this talk for a, a publication, and that made me change the talk. <laughs> OK, so we're now in this thing of two features of what I would particularly do. OK, so in general, um, and I've benefited from IBL workshops in the past and this conference. Um, most of us who are trying this understand that the first week is a pretty important week in terms of the success of the course. And I guess for me to get a feel of who's out there. So how many of you have flipped a course at this point? And how many of you are contemplating flipping a course in the near-term future? So that's a bunch, okay. And then, um, and then some of you are just wondering what the heck those of us doing it are doing. Okay, so, um, so one of the issues that you always hear about is student buy-in. Um, in the previous talk, we heard a little bit about student resistance. And so um, in my title, I proclaimed I was successful. So that's a bit bold. And so one of my successes was we had a peer group, other people teaching in the same room. And of my entire group, which was probably 12 people in a variety of disciplines, I had the least student resistance, and I think it's because of what happened in week one. So I'm encouraging you to think seriously about week one and setting the tone. Um, okay, so that's pretty much done. I had two peculiar goals that you might not share, and that's fine. Um, one of the conferences I loved last year was called The Many Faces of IBL, and so I'm only one face, and you can do it however you feel like. Um, but I had two particular goals. Um, my context, I'm at a research university. We have a lot of students in the class with previous calculus experience. Um, I'm in a special room. For those of you who know what scale-up style rooms is, I'll explain that a little more. <clears throat> and it's um, unlike some of you in a liberal arts college, this is STEM majors and econ only, pretty much. An occasional musician or somebody who's just interested. Um, OK, so one of my two goals, my slide seems to be cut off at the top. So this is, what were the goals for week one? So the first one is that students would productively fail on a pre-calculus task. OK, and I'll explain later what that was. Um, and then. A lot of them were some affective things. So the tasks should be somewhat um, extensible. Groups would be doing, so this are all the IBL kind of things. My room has whiteboards all around. Um, then the issue that's peculiar to calculus at most schools is that some chunk of your class has calculus experience and the other chunk doesn't. And they sit next to each other and in an IBL setting or a flip classroom, they're talking to each other a lot. So this can freak out the pre-calc students' levels that they're not ready for the calculus. There's overconfident students with calculus exposure. Um, and then you know, the instructor goals would be, would be to model the behavior we wanted, establish the environment. <clears throat> One of the questions I asked, similar to the plenary discussion, but a little less emotion of math and a little less negative, was tell me what you learned in pre-calc Tell me something you found really interesting that you did in high school. How do we think that question came out? Seventy-two students, probably five Pythagorean theorems and almost nothing else. It's really depressing. <laughs> okay. Um, then um, I also asked them, what did you learn in pre-calculus that you still find confusing? And again, at first day of class, they were not jumping up. So that came out a little bit limited. I had one guy who really was fixated on trig double angle identities. So he was convinced that that was a crucial building block for the course. 
Okay. Um, and I kind of proved him correct in the second day, but we'll see what that. Okay. Um, and then the second not standard goal was um, this concept of intellectual need of saying um, we're about to go into this whole discussion of limits and derivatives, and we need some context to say why do we want to do this. And the goal was to have the students come up with this, not me tell them you will be interested in limits because I say so. Okay, so, um, so I had to set them into a situation where that would come up naturally. Okay, I have 72 students. The room was totally full. Um, we meet two two-hour sessions a week and then a breakout with a grad student uh, separately, which is in a more traditional kind of style. The room is the scale-up style, so we have eight round tables. Each table is tethered to a, well, or connected underneath to flat panel displays. Everywhere there's not a flat panel, there's whiteboard, or actually whiteboard paint. Um, the instructor station's kind of in the middle, and it's very small, and so it's um, scale-up is sort of the model for this, and there are many other versions. Um, the team was me combined with two undergraduate learning assistants. We have some folks from UC Boulder. They're the gurus of learning assistants, but also the previous talk mentioned peer instruction. Um, so I actually had three of them, but they were job sharing. So um, that worked good. The textbook was a mainstream calculus book. Um, and he used, I used the online homework um, outside of class. I really didn't do much of that in class unless they asked me questions. And it had one of those ask your instructor pieces, so I would tend to handle those offline. Um, most of our students have laptops, so in the room, because of the display panels, I wanted them to use the computers. They, I just told them to bring stuff. Um, we're a Mathematica site license, so they get it for free, put it on their machine. So this is day one. So what did I do day one? Well, we, Walked into the room, I have the advantage, the room is totally weird looking, round tables, flat panels, no front of the room. So the students are kind of, and their first semester freshmen for the most part, so they're kind of primed. We went through the syllabus. Um, the syllabus has some explicit statements. Um, Dana's here, so I have to confess I stole some of his explicit statements from his syllabus. Um, before a class even started, round tables, we saw this at the plenary session, people start talking. So my students were talking to each other before I even, you know, the room, so I think when Dana was a freshman in a large lecture calculus, the whole room was dead silent. I walked in, nothing was happening before. This thing, all kinds of social interaction was going on. Okay, we did some quick polling. Um, I showed some plots, we discussed some pre-calc, and I explicitly got them up on the boards. In a, this one was non-threatening, do some basic things, slopes and rates of change, but also write up your most interesting previous math thing, which I told you was a batting almost zero, your pre-calc questions. And I also asked them, what did you ever do that was interesting with a computer or a calculator? It's another really depressing question if you ask it. Okay, um, so then comes the interesting part. So I said to them, okay, go home, and I'm gonna send you an email. The email said, think about, the, it was very loose and open-ended. Think about sine of x squared and sine squared x. Come back next time. Okay, what do you think happened? So some small chunk of them did it. Uh, I figured very few would. And then also from experience, much as it depresses me, um, I knew students would productively fail on this. That there's gonna be a very small chunk of students who could tell me correctly everything there is to say about sine of x squared and sine squared of x. Okay, so, um, so that's this productive failure idea. And one of the um, education folks is uh, Kapoor. He's done this mostly in middle schools in Singapore which allegedly are the super high performing schools, but he says not, maybe not so well. Okay, so then um, what happened on the second day of week one? Uh, I walked in and I just went to the tables and said, you have sine squared, you have sine of x squared, put up a plot, domain is minus two pi to two pi. Okay, 
They had technology, they have what? What do you think, again, happened? Lots of mess. Okay, so we just sort of stayed back. We wanted them to engage. Um, it was not perhaps as exciting as the video in the plenary earlier, but it worked. Um, in particular, you would guess, nobody in this group basically got signed of, or you would guess a bunch didn't get it right, but virtually no one got it right. Um, all we did was stand back and ask some questions. We never gave answers. We were just, well, is this periodic? Is this even? Is it odd? Is it, what's the range? Okay. Um, you know, when is y equal to a half? When y is the output for the function? Okay. Um, and then I showed them some pictures and we had a major discussion. Okay. And um, this is way too much stuff and it's kind of, Okay, but you can guess what the issues were. They were all kinds of pre-calc issues. Almost no one effectively used the two-piece thinking about the composition. Um, the graph of sine x was sort of invoked properly and improperly. Uh, we had one group where the guy kept telling me, sine of x squared, the zeros, it oscillates exponentially faster, and I kept that's interesting language. Tell me what you mean. Okay, and, um, okay. and, and I pushed them and then, um, okay. And the other part is they all had calculators and they just didn't deploy them efficiently. Okay, so this is sort of very weird. Okay, to remind you, uh, graph of sine squared x looks like that. Um, you'd be hard pressed to the guy who would ask me about double angle identities. I said, okay, here's sine squared. Tell me the double angle identity from the graph. It didn't go very well. It's pretty extremely depressing. Okay, so, um, all right. And, uh, and then this is, you know, sine of x squared drawn by Mathematica in this domain. And so, you know, that's a pretty interesting example for them. Um, okay, so the key things I think that came through in this part was day one uh, was getting ready, but day two was like, you did this, let's talk. This was all done in groups each, either one group per table or two groups per table or maybe three groups per table. But I kind of felt like we couldn't handle that many groups. So I didn't try to do that. Um, okay, and uh, I didn't particularly quantify what the impact for them was, but it was, got their attention. Um, speaking at the boards, I mean, the folks who've done this in more traditional, more method, which this is not, um, testify that this is the magic, right? You stand up, write things down, explain your thinking. That's what makes stuff really go well. Okay, um, I have a colleague, uh, Mary Nelson, and she's got a alternate intervention for all of our calc classes where we do oral reviews voluntarily before exams. I'll be happy to talk to anybody about it. Um, if they're interested, it's a very interesting project. And then, um, they had to go home and write up a careful description of sine of x squared equals negative one half with the mild prompt that four pi squared is slightly larger than 12 pi. <laughs> okay, in case they weren't. Um, all right, and this was basically the first hour of a two hour session for the second day. Um, and then we went towards this thing which is um, plotting some functions. I basically let students nominate functions. We threw up some plots. They're never going to think of a non-differentiable function if you just start asking them, except maybe absolute value of x. So there really wasn't an issue. Yeah. So then we would pick points, zoom in, see the graphs, okay, and they become linear. So we start saying, oh, so the students came up with this idea that there's a local linear approximation, and if we zoom in, that's what we're going to see. And we did a certain number of graphs, enough to get them with some variety. Okay, and then the key thing was to say to them, well, this is interesting. What do you need to know to grab this line? What information? Okay, and uh, so now we had a real need for limits and derivatives, and it came up in a very, you know, with pictures. Okay, um, so this became the recurrent theme. Um, I use this forever in the whole course as explaining things. 
sometimes recursively if we're doing second derivatives, um, inverses, the whole bit, chain rule. Uh, my buzzword phrase that I kept invoking is think locally, act globally. That's, that's my calculus course. Okay, so in particular, like here's one of these plots that eventually, well, we didn't start with tangent lines, we just started with the plot. But here's square root of x in a fairly large scale, and then square root of x zoomed in with a tangent line in the picture, pixel for pixel, they're the same. Okay, the essential difficulty we have in calculus is we're trying to talk carefully about approximation. Okay, and if you're gonna approximate, you're gonna wave your hands sometimes and that makes life hard. Okay, and students are not used to that. They think there's an exact answer and approximation is a weird idea. Okay, so the key things that came out of this were the students decided difference quotients were the interesting object. Um, so then we had a reason to go into the re next week. Um, the calculus students with prior experience were not necessarily invoking. Uh, a lot of students who've been unsuccessful in AP cannot give you the limit definition of derivative as a difference quotient and do anything with it. So, um, so we were kind of building that. Um, and then um, at the end of, so okay, so how did this work and why do I claim it was a success? Well, so first of all, I'm still standing here, so I did no permanent damage <laughs> to me or to the students as far as I can tell. Um, at the end, I had some weird results. So this is one of the key things. If you're contemplating this, you have to go in with your eyes open, especially if you're not tenured. Okay, um, so here's some of the story. Um, my student responses at the end of the term survey were mostly complaining, and their number one complaint when they read the comments was that I lectured too much. And this is when I flipped it and I lectured probably one-tenth or one-twentieth or one-thirtieth of my normal lecture time. Okay, here's what they wrote, which didn't reflect the bad numbers. So here's one verbatim student comment. I'll let you just read it quickly and then zoom on to the next. So the LAs was our shorthand for the learning assistants. Um, so they really liked the board work. Okay. Um, this one was pretty explicit about all that. Okay, so you would think they loved the course. Gosh, you must have gotten great evaluations. Well, no. <laughs> okay, when they had to put numbers, the numbers were, I was below the department average. Okay, I've won a couple of teaching awards. This is really weird. Okay, I can't really explain it, I just know it happened. Um, okay, so I mean, median score for the department overall rating of teaching was five on a Likert scale. My median score was three. Okay, um, then I tried to start looking at some other things to see how students did. Um, so I looked forward at the next course. So I started with 72 students, 44 went on to take Calc 2. Um, I'm still trying to get data from my comparison peers in the other courses. We didn't finish all that long ago. My grade distribution was pretty similar in Calc 2 to the other students in the non-flipped Calc 1 priors. Uh, there was a slightly more A's versus B's, slightly more C's creeping up from D, F, W. Um, okay, the clearest difference was attendance. Students came virtually every class, virtually every student. That never happened in lectures. Um, okay, um, we also had some weird selection process, so we had notation that this was gonna be an active learning class, but it wasn't clear students did that. We had so many students flooding our Calc 1 class that it wasn't clear that students would run the other way either. So I can't tell whether students opted to be in this or not. Um, okay, and now I have some options depending on what <laughs> what I can spend the next few minutes talking about, which is very short. So I have any of those things. Um, maybe since Dane is here, I'll do the syllabus language. Okay, so here's the productive failure part. 
Okay, so it had several motivations, sort of affective and behavioral. Um, so I really wanted to get through to students. So we had this uh, in the previous talk, in this session. Um, students were afraid to go up if they were wrong. So I was just like, let's get that over with day as soon as possible. So right, wrong, doesn't matter. Everybody's wrong at some point. We don't care. I have some language in the syllabus for that too. Um, secondly, I think for the calculus beginning thing, there's really an issue of this variety of students and you know, we have, I had one guy who say, I failed this course three times. <laughs> Please, I need to succeed, you know. And I'm like, well, up to you. Okay, but anyway, having this happen early just got it off the table. So my students had no shyness about going to the boards, <laughs> which was really important. Um, okay, and then there really is this thing about the issue for most of the students who failed calculus before was not calculus so much as it was pre-calculus. And it's very hard to convince them of that by lecturing. Okay, so having them really not do it. Okay, and then um, this part about not having the intermediate thing and composition of functions is just huge. And I wish I had a better um, way to talk through that one. Okay, and I'm just about out of time. So let me, um, well, the syllabus, I guess I, I had advertised I would share the syllabus with you printed out. I realized I had no idea how many people were coming, nor could I fit all those things in my bag. So anybody who actually wants the syllabus, I'm happy to share a link or do whatever. Um, Dana's syllabus was part of my syllabus, so I stole a bunch. Anyway, I was very explicit with students that this is not a lecture. You're gonna be hands-on. You're going to make mistakes. That's how we learn and we're not gonna mock anyone or do anything sort of to inhibit you. So, um, so all of that worked really well, and, um, and maybe I should just take questions or. Uh, Dana Ernst, Northern Arizona University. I'm here because of him, because I had him for Calc 1 and Calc 2. Um, would you do this again? I've already committed to do it again in the fall, and then in the spring, so this past spring, I taught a large Calc 3, non-flipped, in a you know, one-armed bandit kind of auditorium, and I hated it. So I said, well, let me try that. So I'm doing Calc 3 next spring as a comparison. I'm trying to figure out what data to take from this past spring. So yeah, it is tiring, as the previous speaker said, but it's all, and it's also very, you know, you see stuff, right? Everything's out there, and so, you know, sometimes that's discouraging, but, but generally it's really quite interesting. Um, and so um, structuring things is, is worth really thinking carefully about. So, um, so I don't know, I, I may have succeeded by doing everything wrong, but, but it worked for me. Um, and so not being afraid to make mistakes is something you also have to, if you want your students to get up and make mistakes, you have to get up and make mistakes too. So. I'm Wayne Tarrant from Rose Holman Institute of Technology. And I'm wondering, has anybody tried this both in a freshman first class and then in a later class? Because I, I can't figure out, is it easier to convince students who don't know anything about college yet that this is just the way we do things? Or is it easier to have students who have uh, a little bit of background in mathematics uh, to, that they feel a little more comfortable with trying? I, I don't have the experience yet, so I hope somebody can give us some color on that. I, don't, I only have partial experience, so. Um I haven't flipped an upper level course. Um, I could not convince my students this is how we do things in college because I was one section out of like seven <laughs> and they have friends and roommates and people in other classes. So I couldn't say, well, we all do this in college. So I had to really say, this is, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. And they didn't really vote with their feet, but then again, there may have been no options anyway because there may have been no slots. So. We'll see what happens next time. But yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't, there's a lot of people with lots more experience than me.